and welcome to What's in the Box. My name is Sophie Clark and I am here at Wessex Archaeology's head office where I will be speaking to the in-house experts about objects they find most intriguing. I am joined by our in-house senior zoo archaeologist, Lorraine Higby. Hello, Lorraine. Hi there, Sophie. Hi, what have you brought today? Well, in the box, I've got a really interesting object to show you um, that's sort of remained unchanged since the medieval period, right up until the 19th century. And it's a bone tool. Oh, wow, OK. Um, that has a very specific purpose. What, what kind of bone is this? Well, this is what's called a cattle metatarsal. That's basically a foot bone. I can show you a complete example. This is what an entire bone would look like. Oh, right. Okay. And you can see that we've basically got the shaft and the distal end, but it's modified in shape. Yeah, they, they look quite different. Yeah. So okay. basically, um, and someone has taken an entire bone, cut the top off, shaped the top side and I can show you another example where that's perhaps a little bit easier to see you can see these these sort of pale slivers of bone have been removed and there's like these slight flat platforms or facets on all sides of the bone okay so, so they've modified that the shaft of it and also cut some bits off the bottom so if you look at the yes yeah um and the reason for doing this is so that you can use it in the manufacture of pins. So oh. not many people will probably know that um, until the 19th century, when the process was mechanised, it was all done by hand. It was basically a cottage industry in many medieval and post-medieval towns around the whole of the Britain. Um, and this bone was basically a handle that they used to grip bits of wire, copper, usually brass or iron wire, while they individually filed the pins, the, the point of the pin. So if I, if I explain to you a little bit more, so not only has the bone been shaped to give these flat facets, but you can see here that at the top, oh. on all sides, there are little grooves. Yes, yep, I can see those. And those are made with a saw initially. These are a little, this is a, a little bit worn because this one has been used quite extensively. But you'd insert the piece of wire into the groove. And basically the bone allows you to hold it. You, I think usually people will grip them between their knees because they usually sat down doing it. Place the wire in here. And I don't know if you can just about see, but on the other end of these flat facets, there's lots of striations. Yeah. Okay. So basically once you've got the wire in the groove, you use a file and turn the wire and it creates oh, the point of the pin. That makes sense. Oh, OK. I did not know that. So obviously these things wear down um, through, through just the manufacturing process. So huge numbers of these cattle metatarsals were used and needed, required by people basically working in their own homes or small factories around the country just to produce pins for haberdasheries, hat pins, anything you name, really. It's the first start of the process in producing the pin. Wow, that's incredible. So how old would you say this object is in particular? This one is from a site in London, and it's from a okay. post-medieval context. But I think there were quite a large group of the bones in this one individual feature. I think there was at least 10 or 12, all in different states of of wear, um, including some which were unused but slightly modified for use. So we think that there was evidence of a, a house, a terrace house on this site. Um, and we think that the person who lived there at some point was part of the, uh, was a manufacturer of pins just because in their back garden they put the waste products from making oh, those brilliant. pins. So yeah, a little cottage industry, very widespread. And in the 19th century, the process was, was finally mechanized. Um, and 
people no, long, no longer needed these cattle metatarsals okay. for manufacturing pins. It, it was just went into big factories. And one of the main sites of pin producing, once it was mechanised, was in Gloucestershire. And they were producing hundreds of thousands of pins a day, where somebody working in their own house were, were probably lucky to make a couple of hundred a day just using this process. Amazing. And are these from the same sites? Yes, so they they're are. all from the same site. Same and are they yeah. the same animal? This okay. one is from a horse. So usually the um, the natural shape of bones determines can determine what they're manufactured into okay. if if somebody wants to a piece of bone for working. But the uh, metatarsal bones of both cattle and horse are particularly useful for that because on cattle, I don't know if you can just about make out, they've got quite a square profile of the shaft. So if you if you saw off both ends, you've effectively got a really solid cylinder of bone right. from which to work. Yeah. And because it's square, it's a little bit easier to, to grip. Um, so it makes a really good pinner's bone. But you can use horse bones as well and this is exactly the same bone it's a metatarsal but from a horse and it's got a slightly different cross-sectional shape on the shaft so whereas the cattle bone is square this one is circular okay um, but still quite easy to grip so yeah if you imagine you just lob both ends off or even just one end it's very easy for individual workers to just get a bone make those simple modifications and they've got a very cheap tool because yeah. they just be able to get these these bones are basically byproducts of the you know butchery industry. Yes. So yeah. okay, um, because the foot bones don't really have very much meat on them, so they're usually discarded anyway. So they're usually sold on by butchers to bone workers and other people who use byproducts yeah. from the butchery industry. So usually you find in urban towns lots of industries like tanning and um, uh, bone workers, horn workers, what have you, will will be in the same areas of the town as the slaughter yards because yes, they want the byproducts. Yeah. So would you say that these objects required a certain level of skill to produce? Not, no, not at all. Um, it, it's they're very um, easy to make. I think if you you know just to roughly shape the bone in order to make a very rudimentary tool. And the, the process of making pins isn't really very skilled at all either. Okay. Um, it just requires, you know, filing something into a point. Okay. I think the most complex bit is making the head of the pin, but they found methods of doing that. Okay. Um, but it's quite interesting that, I don't know if you've heard of Adam Smith, who was a, a Scottish economist in the oh, 18th right, okay. century yeah but he used the process of making pins and the various stages and the number of people who might uh, be you employed in doing the various stages of pin production as an example in his um, classic book about economics and free market economies and that's called the wealth of nations and in fact it, he gives oh. an example of that in the opening paragraph it's quite interesting um particularly relevant today when we're so much talk about economics and free yeah, markets definitely. and capitalism um, but he was really the doyen of that concept of labor markets and trickle down wow that's um, fascinating and how productivity can lead to um, greater equality in terms of um, wealth. And there was a statue of him in, in Edinburgh. Wow. Oh, wow. So that's, yeah, that's really So amazing. a little connection yeah. you know, to social history, but somebody recognised that um, it was a, a very in, um, involved industry, despite being uns you know, using unskilled labour. Wow, that's fascinating. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about Lorraine's object, please follow the link in the description. You can also learn more by following our social media channels. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>